Welcome to the Draft Utopia Week 6 NFL Digest Recaps Edition. Before we get started, there are a few big campus announcements around Slippery Rock. First off, I'd like to advise everybody at Slippery Rock to vote for somebody for homecoming. It's kind of a big deal because while I may have been a nominee in high school, this is college, this is much bigger, and the students that are getting nominated for a first time, this is their opportunity to grow, and it is their opportunity to shine and rise to the occasion. And these guys have to campaign like politicians. They had to qualify. They had to get through auditions like contestants on American Idol. And now you got the final five guys and the final five gals. At our old high school, we only had four fresh, four fr nominees of each gender. And here at Slippery Rock, you have five, thanks to the generous people of SGA, Buddy, Anthony, Abby, just the whole Student Government Association, the way they've set this up. But let's get back to the bigger issue. Saturday afternoon, Slippery Rock is going to unleash a rock-solid ass-whooping on Clarion for homecoming. That's going to happen. And then there is going to be a kick-ass dance after that. You just need to come. You just need to pay $5. You just need to go to the SGA building, which is right by Boozle and help the school out and take one for the team, you know? It's Saturday. Just go to have fun and enjoy yourself because that's what I'll be doing this Saturday unless there's a really exciting college football game on it. I'm really hoping that the Clemson-Florida State game is on. It doesn't concur with the time of the Slippery Rock game and it doesn't concur with homecoming. Because that, that looks like an awesome matchup. But I got to put my school first this week because this is Clarion, or our biggest rival, and it's homecoming week. So I'm gonna, I am gonna got to make sacrifices. But let's get straight into the action. Giants-Bears, this took place Thursday night. Jay Cutler got the ball to Brandon Marshall as Cutler, and Marshall took care of business against the Giants. The Giants just looked flat-out sloppy. Eli Manning has struggled in 2013. Number 10 is 15 passing interceptions through six games so far, and Little Manning's on pace to break his previous record. He had 25 interceptions back in 2010, which was horrible. That was his worst year in terms of throwing interceptions. The following season, Eli Manning won the Super Bowl. Talk about karma. Talk about irony. And the Giants have a chance to get Clowney, the arguably the best defensive end to come out of college. So if he lives up to the height and proves the critics wrong, then Eli could get a third Super Bowl. But you, you just got to focus on right now what's happening in the present. The Giants are a joke, and they just better win Monday night at home against the Minnesota Vikings because the Vikings have a quarterback issue. The Giants have Eli Manning, and it's unacceptable to be 0-6. I don't care who you are. 0-6 does not cut it in the NFL. The second matchup featured the Green Bay Packers and the Baltimore Ravens. And you have to applaud Green Bay's defense for keeping Joe Flacco scoreless for an entire half without Clay Matthews, the man of Green Bay's defense. Clay Matthews is this team's best player when he's healthy on defense, no doubt about it. Besides Aaron Rodgers, I'd say Matthews is the most important piece to Green Bay's franchise at this point. So you have to like what Green Bay's defense did. Aaron Rodgers needs to take everybody on Green Bay's defense out to the nightclub or pizza or just something to make sure the defense continues to play this well as the season progresses. But, yeah, you got to focus on your upcoming opponent. You play the Cleveland Browns this week. That should be an easy win for Green Bay. And Packers just seem like they're on pace to do big things. The Bengals faced the Bills, and Thaddeus Lewis did it much better as a Bill rather than his previous contests where he struggled against the Pittsburgh Steelers on the road. He played the Bengals at home this time, forced the game into overtime, had a rushing touchdown, threw for two passing touchdowns, and the quick speed and crisp route running of A.J. Green is what made the difference in this game. And six receptions, 100-plus receiving yards, one receiving touchdown, the speed, the route running, getting open at the right time, facing challenges against this pass defense, but still rising to the occasion. That's what gave the Bengals the win this week over the Bills. A win they didn't deserve. They should have won by more. They didn't. It's disappointing. The Lions faced the Browns in Cleveland. 
Matthew Stafford had his way against Cleveland once again. Last time he faced Cleveland, he delivered a clutch win at Ford Field, demoralizing Brady Quinn's ego and career as a starting quarterback in the NFL. Browns fans rem remember this brutal agony at Ford Field, and now they have Brandon Whedon. Would Whedon do better? Well, first quarter, Foria fails Stafford out on a one-yard passing play. Second quarter, Brandon Whedon throws two passing touchdowns. Cleveland went on a 17-0 run and led by 10 at the half. Reggie Bush caught an 18-yard pass from Matthew Stafford. Browns on 17-14 after one. Stafford helps the Lions gain the lead. Joseph Foria with a 23-yard pass to Matthew Stafford, 21-17 Lions. David Akers kicked a 51-yard field goal as the Lions led 24-17 at this point. And Detroit led 31-17 after three. Uh, and no, that Detroit won 31 17. Other game, Houston Texans face the St. Louis Rams. St. Louis infiltrates Reliance Stadium, and Houston's fan base is reliant on Andre Johnson, your star wide receiver, who doesn't deserve an award for complaining about the fan base. Instead, I'm going to credit the man who covered him, the man who struggled for the first few weeks for the St. Louis Rams. I'm talking about cornerback Cortland Finnegan. Now, Finnegan's a guy that's played well over the years. He, can't, he got off to a rough start this year, but he's really picked up the pace in Week 6, especially after that loss against the San Francisco 49ers in Week 4. And Finnegan limits Andre Johnson. He limits him to 88 receiving yards on 7 receptions. And... His defense to play helped the Rams play better because the linebackers, even though you Arian Foster had 100 yards on the ground, he didn't get a rushing touchdown. Matt Schaub didn't throw for a passing touchdown. He left the game injured, and TJ Yates just tanked against the legit Rams secondary in a critical situation, failing to show why he deserves to be the starter over Matt Schaub, and really raising the question as to what the long-term answer for the Houston Texans is at quarterback. Because if Matt Schaub can't beat the St. Louis Rams when he's healthy, is he really your guy for the long term? You really have to wonder. Oakland Raiders face the Kansas City Chiefs, and there are three words to describe the 6-0 Chiefs. Best damn defense in, so far in 2013, period. This defense reminds me a lot of the Steelers' defense that won Super Bowl 33, And you have to credit Scott. Uh, Pioli, even though he's no longer there, because he built this defense through the draft. He used the Patriot system, the Patriot way for bringing in Justin Houston, for bringing in Eric Berry, for bringing in Tom Bahali. And the guy, I think he, he drafted Don Terry Poe his last year. Maybe it was him or a new GM, but they brought in Don Terry Poe. They brought in Brandon Flowers. They get guys in the second and third round. They get quality starters. They develop into pro bowlers. These guys work with Romeo Cornell, and Romeo Cornell's a great defensive mind. And even though Cornell's gone, these guys, they have the confidence to say, you know what, we're better than Romeo Cornell. We can win with Andy Reid. We can win more freedom. We can play at a higher level with more control as long as Andy Reid makes sure, we're, makes sure our team is motivated, we're disciplined, we're playing like a badass football team that's focused on just getting the wins. We're not focused on Alex Smith having the best game every week. We're not focused on... Our offensive line living up to the hype. Brandon Albert playing in a contract year. Eric Fisher trying to assert himself as a quality starting offensive tackle as the number one pick. We want to work on all these things. We need to perfect all these things if we have a chance to get Peyton Manning and the Denver Broncos. But right now, we love the fact that we're 6-0. Arrowhead Stadium is electric. The Red Sea at Arrowhead Stadium is giving Moses fits. That's how infectious Kansas City's crowd is right now and the way this defense is playing. So you really have to like the Chiefs' momentum. And they're playing Houston. I think they play Cleveland or Buffalo in Week 8. So I really like what the Chiefs are doing, and I think they can start 8-0, maybe get to 9-1 and before the game against Denver and really spice things up. But you got to like what the Chiefs have done respect it franchise and accomplished. Another defense that built through the draft was the Panthers. It's still too soon to determine the success of this core, but Luke Keekley had some monster games this past season. He only had seven total tackles against the Vikings, which was kind of disappointing because Adrian Peterson 
at the whole incident. You didn't know if that was going to be a distraction or a psychological problem. I think it was more of a psychological issue. And I want to see Peterson do well next week because Matt Castle's win over the Pittsburgh Steelers, it was an international fluke. Yes, it was because the game was in London and Vikings lived in Greenland and London and they were descendants that came to America. Christopher Columbus was a descendant of, um, I don't know if it was like green crap. My history teachers are going to kill me for not knowing this because Vikings had a role in discovering America and Christopher Columbus was a part of it. So I think that had something to do with Minnesota's win over Pittsburgh. But yes, because the game was about Vikings discovering America's team and whooping their ass without Christian Potter. That was the storyline from that game in week four. But we got to focus on the Steelers team in week six coming off the bye week, the New York Jets on the road. And I asked some people in the second floor in Rhodes Hall, some people in the third floor in Rhodes Hall, Hoda, Chris, and Toadie. There were some of Toadie's friends in the second floor of Matt. I'm terrible with names, but a lot of people I talked to told me that my sources, according to uh, ESPN's Adam Schefter, or uh, you got to get more into the reporter modes, but yeah. People I talked to said it was the defense, and I have to agree with that statement. The defense did more for this Pittsburgh team than the offense because Geno Smith did not manage to score a touchdown. He was clutch against Atlanta. He was clutch against Tampa Bay. If he didn't throw so many interceptions in Gillette Stadium, the Jets would have defeated the Patriots because Tom Brady had an off game due to lousy receivers. And the Jets, they do well in Week 3 and surprise people against the Bills team that hadn't allowed a single sack. They get eight sacks on EJ Manuel. And they're one of these roller coaster teams. One week they're hot, the next week they're cold. Katy Perry is singing about uh, Mark Sanchez's post NFL career, and we don't know what drama is going on in New York, nor do we care to know. Well, I don't care to know since I'm a Patriots fan, but that's just me. And the New York Jets, they're an interesting bubble team this year. They've played better than people have given them credit for, but they're still a joke because Geno Smith lacks the experience. And because Kellen Winslow's out for four games, they're going to fall apart. We saw that happen this week against the Steelers when Winslow was tested positive for his PED performance-enhancing drugs. And Santonio Holmes was also out with an injury. So Jets fans can use the injury excuse as a reason, a weak excuse as a reason for why the Steelers won their first game of the season. Nevertheless, it was a win the AFC North is still up for grabs, and the Steelers can still take the division if they kick the Ravens' butt at Heinz Field next week, which they will since Joe Flacco sucks, and he got way too much money. I'm not saying that he didn't earn the Super Bowl last year. He clearly earned it. 11 touchdowns, no picks, outstanding playoff play, double overtime win. Champ Bailey, he catches Bailey napping. He catches Champ Bailey suffering from an early Alzheimer's NFL playoff syndrome. No offense to Champ Bailey. Bailey just hasn't been the same since that playoff loss. Philadelphia Eagles played the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and Nick Foles had a quality fourth quarter on the road against the New York Giants against a quality secondary. And how would he fare this week against an even better Tampa Bay defense with Revis, Mark Barron, Goldston, Jonathan Banks anchoring the secondary first quarter, Foles kicks things off with a four-yard rushing touchdown. Philadelphia is flying. They bowling. Eagles up 7 nothing. I'm the Buccaneers with a field goal. Second quarter, Vincent Jackson illustrates toughness and displays a surprise return from his injury after missing action against the Arizona Cardinals by obtaining 24 receiving touch by a 24 receiving yard touchdown by Mike Glennon. And then Foles through his second had his second touchdown of the game. Foles puts the Eagles up 14-10 before Vincent Jackson scored again at halftime. Foles had a passing and a rushing touchdown at halftime. Third quarter, Riley Cooper, 47-yard receiving touchdown from Foles. Eagles regain the lead and go up 21-17. 
Ryan Lindell made it a one-point game in the fourth quarter with a field goal before Deshaun Jackson sealed Tampa Bay's fate, infiltrating Revis Island in the fourth quarter with a critical clutch receiving touchdown. And I like the way that Vincent Jackson just came back. He owned it. He was playing injured with... He was supposed to be out for six weeks, comes back two weeks later. He gets 100 yards against the Eagles. I know the Eagles have the worst secondary or one of the worst in the NFL because they have no identity at cornerback. That still doesn't change the fact that Vincent Jackson came back much better than expected, played at a high level, and gave the Tampa Bay Buccaneers a chance to win this game. It's a shame they don't have a quarterback because if they did, I think they might have had a chance against the Eagles. It really illustrates Greg Schiano's inability to lead as head coach. Jaguars-Broncos, first quarter, Manning and the Broncos favored by an unreasonable 27.5 points. The bookies in Las Vegas are giving Denver fans no justice. They want to see Peyton Manning dominate. He deserves to be favored by 20 points, but 27.5 is unreasonable. You're basically giving fans like myself a valid reason to pick the Jaguars to cover the spread. But Manning dropped back. He threw to Julius Thomas for a passing touchdown. Then he threw another passing touchdown to Wes Welker. 14-0, Denver led. Josh Scobie with a 50-yard field goal. Scobie with another 30-yard field goal. Denver led 14-6 after Josh Scobie got two field goals on special teams for the Jaguars that averaged 40 yards per kick. Paul Puzlozny caught a 59-yard interception and returned the pick six for six points. You're thinking, okay, Jacksonville may win, and they may totally get the spread intact, right? Wrong. Well, they went for two, they failed, and Denver led 14-12 to 12 at this point. No Sean Moreno breaks down the Jaguar wall in Denver by infiltrating the goal line. Maurice Jones-Drew responded with a similar play. The Jaguars scored in a five-yard run. Then Moreno was like, I'm going to get an eight-yard run. He got another goal line touchdown. Moreno wins the goal line's touchdown battle with Jones-Drew, 2-1. to one. Denver wins 35-19 to because Peyton Manning took care of business in the first quarter, even though he played like crap afterwards against an extremely underrated Jaguars pass defense that, gets not, that doesn't command enough respect from people around the league. The Titans-Seahawks, Seahawks won 20-13. Jake Locker didn't start. Both teams were shaky statistically on both sides of the ball. It was a really boring game. There wasn't really a key player that stood out, but the Seahawks won. Marshall Lynch had the two rushing touchdowns, and there was great run blocking by the offensive line. Seattle's right guard really did a good job opening up lanes for Marshawn Lynch to capitalize on, and that led to Seattle's victory. New Orleans Saints versus the New England Patriots. Steven Gostowski with a field goal puts New England up 3-0. Second quarter, 7-3 Saints. Steven Ridley, one-yard rushing touchdown. Patriots up 10-7. The Patriots are marching in the Saints' end zone. Patriots led 17-7 at halftime. Late in the third quarter, Stephen Gostowski with a 54-yard field goal. Patriots took a 20-17 lead after the Saints go marching to Gillette Stadium on a 10-yard run. Patriots led, lead 20, led on a 23-yard field goal, 23-17. Kenny Stills with a 34-yard pass from Drew Brees. Brees puts the game back in reach for New Orleans. Graham Hartley escalates the lead with a critical special teams kick. That puts the Saints up 27-23 thanks to a 39-yard field goal. The Boston Red Sox were in a similar situation, down 5-1, before Big Poppy hit a grand slam. That ignited Red Sox Nation. That moved Boston's fan base. And Tom Brady responded in very similar attire with a game-winning touchdown to Kendrell Topkins with five seconds left as Boston fans went nuts. Boston... New England sports nation, every radio station in Boston around the country was stoked this Sunday. And I feel like that's an understatement. But you really felt this emotional intensity from Boston fans. And they're proud that both of their teams won in such clutch fashion. That made Boston's weak. That made the city of Boston proud to root for their teams. Even though New England is in other states in the Northeast region, they play in the state of Massachusetts. So most people associate them with Boston because they're both in Massachusetts. Boston and the Gillette Stadium are both in Massachusetts. So don't blame me. Blame the people that want to come up with geography terms for NFL teams or people that look at the team's location 
and decided to group them with Boston, even though they're different parts of the state of Massachusetts. That's probably something my geography teacher would complain about and say that New England sports fans and Boston sports fans are the same thing. When, theoretically, according to geography, they're not. Do they root for the same teams? Yes. Do they root for the same teams in different cities? Absolutely. But they're not the same fan bases because they're both different cities. The argument that Boston sports fans and New England sports fans are both sports fans in the same cities is counterintuitive. They are cities that have sports teams in the same state, but they're not sports cities that are in the same sports city. So that argument's just counterintuitive, and it's like, who cares? Cardinals 49ers, Phil Dawson with back-to-back -back field goals, puts San Francisco up 6-0. Carson Palmer fires a 75-yard pass downfield to Larry Fitzgerald. After that, Palmer got sacked for a safety. San Francisco up 8-7. Colin Kaepernick knows how to play deep pass in Game 2. He responds with a 61-yard passing touchdown to Vernon Davis. 49ers hold an 8-point lead. Andre Ellington with a 15-yard run to the outside. Ellington runs to the right with great run blocking by Arizona's right guard. The opening up the hole for the former Clemson Tiger, 15-14, 49ers by one. Colin Kaepernick decides to show Arizona medium passing game by throwing a 35-yard touchdown pass to, yes, Vernon Davis. Once again, Arizona's got horrible safeties, and Kaepernick has one of the NFL's best tight ends in Vernon Davis, which is something he can leverage against Arizona's secondary in terms of getting points on the board. Uh, put the 49ers up 22 to 14 at the half. Third quarter, Carson Palmer decides to play short passing game, showing Kaepernick a thing or two about the West Coast offense. And he throws a 10 yard touchdown pass to Michael Floyd. It's a red zone touchdown. And the Cardinals are in striking position to tie the game. Arizona goes for two, and it's no good. 22 to 20, 49ers after three. Stopping Arizona from converting the two point conversion was huge because it motivated the 49ers offense to get their act together. Kendall Hunter displays clutch rushing touchdown inside the red zone. 49ers gain a 29 to 10 lead. They won 32 to 20 rather than 32 to 10, but 32 20 win over the Cardinals. Vernon Davis, 180 receiving yards, six receptions, and two receiving touchdowns. Vernon Davis is your fantasy tight end of the week. Two games left. Redskins Cowboys in Week 6, Tony Romo was scrutinized for having 170 passing yards instead of 506 passing yards. Who cares, fantasy owners? Romo shouldn't be scrutinized because his team won the game this week. The guy that should be scrutinized is the Washington Redskins quarterback, Robert Griffin III. The guy that failed to throw for zero passing touchdowns in Dallas when Morris Claiborne gets benched at cornerback. When Cl your top... And draft pick that's extremely hyped gets benched at cornerback for a poor play. That's an opportunity to build momentum against a weak pass defense. It's an opportunity to escalate. It's an opportunity to regain your confidence because you established confidence and swagger when you defeated the Dallas Cowboys at home against FedEx at FedEx Field in Week 17. You're going to Dallas this time around for Sunday Night Football after you, you get the hype, the critical clutch. Rookie of the Year moment where you defeat Dallas on Sunday Night Football in the final week of the season. And Robert Griffin's streak for not throwing passing touchdowns in the first half continued, and this was at least his second or third game where he didn't throw a, a passing touchdown for the entire game. But, wow, it's just... RG3... I'm at the point where I'm tempted to put Kirk Cousins in to see what he can do because... You're not going to go anywhere this year, and since the Rams own your draft pick, why not start Cousins and rest RG3, get his ACL better, condition him better, give him a whole offseason to work with the players off the field to regain his confidence, and if he doesn't get his stuff together and Kirk Cousins does well, he wins some games, you know what? Maybe it's time to make Kirk Cousins your starter, or you trade Kirk Cousins for extra draft picks and you keep RG3. I don't know. Just try something because this is five weeks in a row where RG3 hasn't thrown a passing touchdown in the first half, and he won Rookie of the Year last year. So that's unacceptable for him to be playing that poorly when he set the bar so high last year. The Colts faced the San Diego Chargers in Monday Night Football. This was a pretty boring game, but Nick Novak sealed Andrew Luck's fate in San Diego. Field goals up and good. 
Chargers win 19-9. I thought Andrew Luck would win this game because he played in, on the West Coast when he went to Stanford. But Monte Teo was playing. Keenan Allen was also playing. And make sure to vote for Keenan Allen instead of Monte Teo for Rookie of the Week because Keenan Allen was a third-round draft pick with nine receptions, 107 receiving t- yards, and one receiving touchdown. And Monte Teo, thanks for playing Week 6, but you don't win Diet Pepsi Rookie of the Week because people with fake girlfriends are not eligible for Rookie of the Week awards. Thank you for listening to this 25-minute speech, and I doubt this will get uploaded on YouTube, but if it does, God bless you, God bless Slippery Rock, God bless everybody that votes for Homecoming, and God bless you if you had the patience and attention span to listen to me rant about sports for 26 minutes. Ransom is out.